Portland, Oregon is known for its mouth-watering food scene. Whether you're vegan, gluten-free, vegetarian, a meat lover, or a pescatarian, Portland has something for everyone satisfying any budget, big or small. From high-end restaurants and upscale cocktail bars to cheap eats at food carts, Portland is known for craft beer, coffee, chocolate, donuts, wine, and more. Weaved into the city's fabric and identity, Portland's vibrant food scene pushes the boundaries of creativity and innovation, celebrates diverse ethnic culinary traditions, and there's a real sense of community and collaboration from foodpreneurs, chefs, and food artisans supporting one another. Portland has become this like hub for young chefs to bartenders to you know, operators. But I feel like Portland became this hub of a city that allowed for this creative expression and growth. That's Colin Nicholas, the owner of Fools and Horses and Pink Rabbit Bar in Portland, Oregon. You'll hear more from him a little later. Wanting to see if the claims were true, I set out on an investigative mission to explore if Portland is indeed a foodie town and if we should believe the hype. For my take, you'll have to listen until the end of the episode. So, is Portland one of America's top foodie cities? Well, to narrow things down, I focus on what I'm calling the four tastes of Portland. Savory, sweet, sour, and bitter. Eating and drinking my way around the city, I'll share where to eat in Portland and my favorite must-try food and beverage picks in each of these four categories. You'll also hear from Portland foodpreneurs and food tour operators who share how they got their start and why Portland's culinary scene is unmatched. A special thank you to Travel Portland for making this episode possible. I've teamed up with Travel Portland to discover Portland's incredible food and drink scene and also share these inspiring entrepreneurial stories from some of Portland's talented fruitpreneurs growing thriving businesses. Welcome to The Thought Card, a podcast about travel and money, where planning, saving, and creativity leads to affording travel, building wealth, and paying off debt. We are the Financially Savvy Travelers. You might be familiar with food trucks, but food carts are what you can expect in Portland. Food carts are small, mobile eateries you can walk right up to, place an order, and start chowing down within a few minutes. These are great for budget-conscious diners or if you're looking to grab a quick bite to eat on the go. Food carts offer a wide range of affordable and delicious street food, serving everything from quesadillas, gourmet grilled cheese sandwiches, tacos, dumplings, crepes, and so much more. While you can find individual carts around the city, it's common to see groups of carts together in a pod. Portland is home to hundreds of food carts, and according to recent studies, Portland is the number one food truck-friendly city in the country. So why are there so many food trucks in Portland? Starting a food truck is an affordable and accessible way to break into the food scene, start a business, and share culinary creations. Many establishments, which started as a cart, have actually moved on into brick-and-mortar locations across the city as a result of their food cart following and success. So this brings me to my first recommendation. For my lunch food cart pick, visit Fried Egg I'm in Love at Pioneer Courthouse Square for some Yolki sandwich goodness. With fun-named items on the menu like Free range against the machine. You really can't miss this bright yellow cart. My wait time was less than 15 minutes. 
Now, this recommendation is for coffee lovers. While Portland has a lot of coffee shops and is a well-known coffee city, Portland Cafe is on a mission to destigmatize and challenge the narrative that Vietnamese coffee beans are of lower grade. Specializing in Robusta and other types of beans from Vietnam, Portland Cafe is Portland's first Vietnamese specialty coffee house. Portland, Oregon is one of the best coffee cities in the world. I may be biased, but I really do think that we have amazing coffee here. We have a great coffee scene. And just growing up here, I was born and raised here. I've never seen Vietnamese coffee beans in any kind of specialty coffee shop. And I never really thought twice about it because I am big fans of like the Ethiopian, the Colombian coffees, the Brazil coffees. Like I really do enjoy them and I always gravitated towards them. So it wasn't anything that I was worried about, I would say. I left a coffee world back in 2016 to switch gears to go into social services work. And during that time, I started to miss the coffee world, but it wasn't something that I was able to go back to. I wanted to learn how to roast. And while I was trying to do some research on that, it came through a Reddit thread about coffee production in Vietnam. And I realized that Vietnam was the second largest coffee producer in the world behind Brazil and the number one robust bean producer in the world. And I was mind blown to know that because even though they're leading this huge coffee production company, they're not represented in the specialty coffee field. And so I wanted to change that somehow, some way. While CAFE is about Vietnamese coffee, it's equally about uplifting and supporting communities as well. Walking into Partland Cafe, you'll be greeted by a familiar smell of coffee brewing. The coffee shop is bright with greenery and features a large captivating mural of Vietnam highlighting major cities. Ordering a creamy hot latte, the tofu sandwich was absolutely delicious. The spicy sauce, while unexpected, I will say was approachable and finger licking good. At Portland Cafe, you can also find Vietnamese inspired donuts by Heyday PDX which is going to be my top sweet pick. I had a chance to sit down with the owner of Heyday PDX. Have a listen. Our donuts are made with rice flour and they are naturally gluten-free that way, but they are kind of a representation of desserts that I've grown up eating all my life. Everything that I've eaten through Vietnamese Baked goods have been made with rice flour, whether it was steamed or fried or baked. So this baked donut is basically all of that encompassed in that shape. I feel like it's kind of like the uh, Vietnamese American take on if we could ever have a donut, it would look like this. Donuts have been a a family thing that we've done when we were kids. It was like the way that my dad showed us love. Our thing was donuts every Sunday. You know, he would come and we would go and pick up our donut and eat it. And that was it. You know, nothing special, nothing big. It was just something that we did almost every weekend or every Sunday. I've kind of brought that over to my kids. And so when we decided to do this, it was just a conversation I had with my mom, actually. And we were eating donuts and she's like, I think you can make these better. (laughs) And, And that was it. We took that and my partner was like, yeah, let's just do it. And we just did it. So that part of it is special. I wanted to make it in a more inclusive, made it an opportunity for other people to have those experiences as well. And how do I incorporate that with what I've grown up with too? Besides coffee, I think donuts is probably the next Portland thing. And we have a whole bunch of different ones. And I feel like it, they all have their own special thing or they have their own special touch on something. Like I would go somewhere for like an apple fritter or a maple bar. And then you have Pips who make these like really cute, like cake donuts that are fresh. You know, we're also in the land of tea, but there's room for everybody. And you kind of just have to stay true to what you want to do and stay true to who you are and be proud of your product and what you're making. But it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. There's always room for everybody to do what they want to do. And so I kind of took that and decided to do it. But I've been really supported by a lot of them. And we're all pretty good friends. And I don't feel that there is any really real competition at all. If anything, it's been really nice to have their support. 
ask them questions, be able to lean on them. And because they know what that lifestyle is like too. You know, it's it's a little bit grueling sometimes when, you know, we have to wake up at three in the morning to get the, everything's done. But there is definitely a comfort in knowing that I'm supported by them and not someone that they're trying to compete with. One of the experiences that I was able to have in Portland is this like sense of entrepreneurship, like a can-do attitude and a spirit of collaboration as well. So I know that Hey Day is featured in multiple locations. So can you tell us more about the spirit of collaboration in Portland and how it's helped your business grow? I think that because we were a business that started during the pandemic, I initially already had to build partnerships in order to pop up in certain coffee shops and tea shops and things like that. So for us as a business, that was natural. And it's kind of something that we quickly learned that we wanted to always be a part of. We always wanted to be in partnerships with people. We've always wanted to work with people. And even with our brick and mortar, we're we're continuing to still do that as a brand and a company. I feel like if anything, the pandemic had made it easier to do that because I think we did all need each other regardless of what area of the service industry we were in. We needed to be able to help support one another to survive. You know, and so I think for me, it started off pretty fast in knowing that, okay, I wanted to pop up in these locations because I wanted to bring business to these locations, right? And that was a given. And so then I got very picky about where we should pop up. And also, if we align in the same things that we believe in, you know, like I wanted to be with people who are inclusive and people who understand what we believe in, what we stand for beyond the donuts and the coffee, right? We wanted to be with people that were like minded. And so, it ended up being more of like, what businesses can we help lift up and support rather than how many donuts I'm going to be able to sell today. So it made it more fun and it made me more purposeful to be able to partner with the right kind of people and to do the right kind of events and the right kind of collaborations with people. As an update, Heyday PDX recently opened their first brick and mortar location in Portland. So I am sending a big congratulations to Lisa and the Heyday team. For more sweet treats, don't miss chocolate tastings while you're in town. Chocolate is the new wave of cool things in Portland. Uh, We now have several chocolate factories where they're actually making chocolate from cocoa beans. So you'll be able to taste chocolate anywhere from drinking chocolate to uh, little chocolate confections. And so it's another good reason to ride your bike around town. You've just heard from Todd Roll, an Oregon native and the owner of Pedal Bicycle Tours. Todd's Donuts of Portland bike tour was a major highlight of my trip. Biking is a phenomenal way to see the city, cruise through several of Portland's neighborhoods, and try all sorts of donuts around town. Hi, I'm Todd Roll with Pedal Bicycle Tours in Portland, Oregon. Pedal is uh, 14 years old now. I started it in uh, 2008. My mission is to show people how easy, safe, and fun it is to explore a city by bike and hopefully to spur people to go back home and ride their bike more often or buy a bike if they didn't have one and also to get involved in their local bike community to push their own communities to become more bike friendly because I really do feel that it is the best way to explore. Not only is it a healthy way to get around, it's a super planet-friendly way to get places, and you work up a nice appetite. We've got three different tours. We've got a brewery tour, our introduction to Portland tour is our most popular tour, and then today you did the donut tour, which is also very popular. Both the brewery and the donut tours are a nice mix of... uh, a little bit of sin and a little bit of health. So you either get some sugar or some tastes of beer while you ride around and see the city. I call Portland uh, America's bicycle capital because we are the most bike-friendly place in the United States, certainly for large cities. Moving on to Sour, make your way to Cascade Brewing, the House of Sours, a must-do for sour beer lovers on a quest for tartness. Specializing in brewing sour beers with a high level of acidity, I suggest building your own flight so you can sample a variety of handcrafted fruit-forward sours from simple and mildly acidic to more complex, aggressive tart notes. 
if you're open to an intense sensory experience and don't mind making a few faces, add this laid back brew pub to your itinerary. When I think of savory flavors, I'm immediately drawn to comfort food, you know, warm, hearty dishes that remind me of the good old days or my childhood. But instead of reaching for carby go-tos like mac and cheese or mashed potatoes, I encourage you to try vegan plant-based Japanese comfort food at Obon Shikudo, which actually started at a farmer's market and expanded to a restaurant space in 2021. For rich and savory flavors, tempura udon will check off all of your boxes. Handmade noodles in a soy mushroom broth, fried tofu, and scallions hit the saltiness spot. Speaking of vegan options, here's another. Mama Dut features Vietnamese-inspired vegan dishes. Items on the menu include pork belly, oyster mushroom sandwich, and chicken fried mushrooms, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Here's a fun fact. Mama Dut means mama will feed you. And a quick note, there's no seating here, but you can go next door, become a patron by grabbing a drink, and enjoying your Mama Dut vegan meal there. All right, now we're down to the wire. Here's my final pick for the bitter category. My Bitter Pick takes us to Fools and Horses, a cocktail bar and kitchen in the Pearl District, specializing in Hawaiian Paniolo-inspired fare. Walking into Fools and Horses for dinner and cocktails, the space was dark and sophisticated. Perfect for a date night. Grabbing seats at the bar, I met up with Kay Kingsman from The Awkward Traveler, a Portland-based travel blogger and friend who shares helpful travel tips, destination guides, and think pieces. In the show notes, I'll link to some of Kay's Portland articles, including 30 Black-owned restaurants in Portland and 11 brunch spots in Portland. Kay is really knowledgeable of things to do in Portland, so highly recommend checking her out. Hearing from the owner, Colin Nicholas, here's what you can expect at Fools and Horses and the inspiration behind the Hawaiian Paniolo Fair. Colin is a California native who moved to Portland five years ago, pre-pandemic, for a consulting job. He was only supposed to stay in Portland for nine months, but five years later, he's still there, owning and operating two bars. My name is Colin Nicholas, and I am the owner of Fools and Horses and Pink Rabbit Bar in Portland, Oregon. From the culinary standpoint, was completely inspired by our chef Alex Wong and his background and his childhood growing up in Hawaii, and then also really embracing some of those you know traditions and the techniques that are associated with those traditions from his you know ancestors and people and community that came before him. And so you had hired Alex originally as the head chef at Pink Rabbit and had this sort of like seed plan to move on to the second space, which then became Fools and Horses. I started peeling back these layers, right? And sort of tea was, right? And we're kind of getting to know one another. And I'm understanding all of this incredible history about not only his family, not only about himself as a person and a chef, I'd love to get your personal take on recommendations for bitter cocktails on the menu. Absolutely. So the eight seconds, kind of more traditional Negroni build. So an equal parts cocktail, basically a vermouth product, a bittering agent, and then a spirit. And for this cocktail, we're using grappa. So it is a grape-based distillate that has this kind of astringency to it. It's a little funk, not crazy hot in the cocktail, not super, super, super over the top assertive. And then that's paired with Aperol and then Punta Mess is the sweet vermouth alternative that I'm using in that recipe. And so overall, a totally well-balanced cocktail, certainly bitter, certainly bright, but absolutely balanced. That's my favorite on the menu as it stands currently. But we do have you know a lot of things on the menu that do pull in that bitter quality in order to see those other ingredients really shine. Similar to like seasoning your food, add that level of dimension and and layers of flavor. We're doing the same thing by introducing some of those bitter components to not only, again, celebrate and enhance the other qualities of drinks, but create an overall balance of a sensory on your palate. 
First and foremost, I am honored to be the bitter pick of <laughs> your Portland food and beverage experience. People can expect a sexy, sophisticated, dark, warm space when they walk in. It is a smaller bar, relatively speaking. And so I wanted to create a sense of openness when you walk in, so clear line of sight. And I really wanted to create individual moments in that space as well because of the fact that I inherited you know, the bones of this building, right? Really creating these sort of some discovery moments for guests, but also just unapologetically explicit, boom, this is who we are and this is where we're at. Walking into that like altar of a bar and back bar that's lit and has that pressed tin to the wall coverings in that sort of elevated, raised, staged area. So people can count on and expect to walk in and not only feel very welcomed, but to feel warm and to feel comfortable and they're in an approachable space. Yes. You know, when I walked in, I definitely felt grown and sexy, but also (laughs) I felt like it was also casual too. So I didn't have to necessarily be dressed to the nines to feel comfortable as well. So it kind of felt like come as you are, but the setting is grown and sexy and we're going to enjoy ourselves tonight. You kind of like said it perfectly. um, Come as you are. Overall, I had a phenomenal time visiting Portland. I had my fill and I came back home a few pounds delightfully heavier and with a lot of stories and recommendations to share with you all. So here's the moment of truth. Back to the question of the episode. Does Portland have a good food scene? I'll say yes. Portland, Oregon has a thriving food scene with diverse and evolving offerings from street food to gourmet creations, making it a really great destination for foodies and culinary enthusiasts. There's a lot of competition, which I could imagine really inspires all of the players to rise to the occasion and seize the opportunity to stand out and really share what's on their heart. Lisa from Portland Cafe and Kim from Heyday PDX said it best. We have really amazing food here. And it's not the popular stuff that you hear either, which is the really cool part of Portland too. It's that like, we have a lot of mom and pop, very, very small business owners that are cooking amazing food. The big name people are cooking amazing food as well. We don't have to travel very far to get good food. Like when now when I travel and I go to other places, I'm like, oh, home is pretty darn good too. I would recommend like trying something that's not as popular. We have so many good little pockets of food here, food carts, amazing. But I feel like Portland now is becoming the land of pop-ups. Our city is a pop-up city. And if you can catch one of those amazing pop-ups that are happening on your trip, I would definitely go to one. I want to echo what Lisa said, that we have amazing food here. I would like to emphasize that we have a lot of amazing mom and pop Vietnamese shops and just in general, mom and pop places that don't get a lot of love on these like maps and stuff that you may Google. So I would totally, definitely echo what Lisa says that just go and try these other places that are not getting the love that big name places get, such as like myself, like you know, you Google Vietnamese coffee and you're probably going to see Portland Cafe, but there's so many other places that have it as well too, that you should totally visit. So with that, add Portland to your travel wish list and bring stretchy pants, my friends, because you're really going to need it. Have you been to Portland or are you interested in visiting Portland after listening to this episode? Hey, did you learn something? Or do you agree with Portland being a top foodie city? So many questions for y'all, right? Let me know your thoughts in the accompanying blog post over at thoughtcard.com. Or you can leave me a voicemail with your thoughts. The link will be in the show notes. A special thank you to Travel Portland for partnering with me on this episode and my incredible guests. For more deep dive destination episodes just like this one, listen to episode 91 for where to experience art and culture in Tempe, Arizona. 
or episode number 86, where I shared with you five reasons to visit Rochester, New York. And lastly, if you are a destination or attraction, restaurant, bar, brewery, and you'd like to be featured on the Thought Card Podcast, please reach out to me. Let's chat. I'd love to work with you. You can reach me over at thethoughtcard at gmail.com. Again, that's thethoughtcard at gmail.com. Until next time, financially savvy travelers. Bye.